going to do some announcements first. Thank you. I'm being recorded now. Welcome, everybody. We have a good turnout here. And how many do we have online? Uh, 15, 16 online. So a good, a good group. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to go back a little bit. Ken's going to take us back and forward because a film is not uh, the film is not dead yet. All right. So that's mm -hmm. that's that, that, that's our topic for tonight. Uh, but before we get into the topic, I have a few announcements. We do have some things on the schedule. Okay. First, first things up, um, October 14th, Halloween photo shoot, um, uh, four, four to eight, four to eight on Saturday. Okay. Can I do a minus here? Members you only. You, oh yeah, okay. you can do that. Um, and I've seen uh, the prop that Kim has created for the models. You've got to come in and see it. Oh, model. Okay, model. Uh, and uh, they always have a lot of fun at the Halloween uh, shoot. Um, October 15th, okay, midnight to submit your entries for the October photo competition. So that's coming up soon. Um, the competition, what's the, the theme? Uh, the, the theme is calm, <laughs> peace, calm, peaceful. It'll, it's in your newsletter, but remember that the deadline is on October 15th, midnight. And uh, the rules and how to how to enter has been posted, and it's also in the newsletter. Um, we have a couple really great speakers coming up, okay, October 16th. Um, we're going to have uh, how, uh, the bird and wildlife photography uh, talk, and that's going to be a, a nice, uh, nice uh, talk. Um, and then October 30th, remember, we have a, a third meeting in October. October 30th is our competition night. So that's when uh, our critique and we announce the winners for uh, the October uh, competition. Um, November 6th is going to be gear night. So we have a lot of good speakers, a lot of good membership uh, presentations like Ken's tonight. Um, and we do have a couple of really good uh, guest speakers coming in. Um, we are going to have the um, annual meeting, okay? This is to remind myself, because I got to get ready for it. That's December 18th. And the, the annual meeting is where we're going to be electing new officers. So you might be called, you will be called to uh, put your name in the hat. We're going to need a vice president. We also need a um, financial officer. Bill has agreed to you know, continue on, but he needs to retire. From, from the position. Uh, we could use uh, one or two new board members also. And of course, all the committees are filled by basically one person. Okay? We have some people who help, but we could always use more, more volunteers. Angel, Angel, James, and Greg have stepped forward to put that gorgeous gallery wall out in our hall soon. Okay, So that's what we need. We need some people just to step up. We got lots of ideas. Um, and we need uh, more, more workers. The other thing that we need people to step up for, and do I have that on my list? I want to ask Kim, the Santa shoots. We might have three. We do have three. And that that is not only, say that again? December 16th, that's the first one? Fairgrounds fairgrounds north okay and that's a tradition for us we have our santa set up for that one correct uh and and we and we need a lot of work okay it's a lot of work it's a lot of, it's 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 fun work right kim um but it, it is a it's a membership um fundraiser okay so we, we we have to keep the lights on and that's something that kim's doing has done for years and, and it does bring in uh finances for us right Anything else that anybody that I miss? Yes, Bob. Mention my survey I sent out to everybody. Um, I sent out a survey to everybody. If you could please uh, share your thoughts and opinions about First Mondays, I'd greatly appreciate it. Yeah, that we, we're looking for ideas. We're looking for volunteers. We're looking for people who want to share, and it doesn't have to be just you. If you have somebody else that can, you know, uh, uh, tag team with you and uh, present some uh, uh, some skill sets, some interests, something like that. That's really what, what, what we're here for. That helps our socialization too. 
because we have a lot of talent within the club. And, uh, you know, that's why we're here to share that. Um, and I forgot to send this to Ginny. Okay. Sorry, Ginny. Um, the, the flash workshop that we'll be doing here, which is on the 28th, 28th, that's October. Okay. Uh, we're going to, we're going to meet here at 12 o'clock. It's uh, it's a, an extension of, of my talk that I did a couple weeks ago on fun with flash. So we're going to set up like the bubble tank. We're going to set up uh, you know, a multi multi exposure, things like that. We're going to do some stroboscopic stuff, just have fun, experiment, learn together. So I'm going to bring in some equipment. Kim's going to bring in hers. We're going to have a nice big black backdrop here. And we're going to do we have do we have a, a model yet? If we don't have a model, Angel's going to dance. No, I'm going to I'm going to pick on Angel all night because he he's sitting back here in the back. Uh, well, yeah, you sit in the back, Angel. You look right, my eye. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be here at uh, twelve to say three three thirty ish. Okay, that's on the twenty eighth here, uh, members only. Okay, or or we do have a couple guests here, so I'll say you're welcome uh, if you're not a member yet. Um, but uh, that's going to be some fun, and hopefully we'll learn something and teach each other. Okay, that's all I have right now, unless I forgot something. Anybody What's else? The first Monday. Of the first Monday oh. tonight. Yeah, on first Monday, we generally have somebody from the club. Oh, let here, Jenny. They can hear you. Say it. First, first Mondays is the presentation is run by a member. Okay, someone within within the club. And then our third Monday is our big big time guest speakers. So usually zoom in. We've had a couple a uh, couple uh, speak from here also. But they're usually zooming in, and our next one's going to be zooming in from Great Britain, to Canada. Uh, then we're going to have somebody from Great Britain. Then we're going to have somebody, I believe, from Australia. So they're they're coming in to uh, to speak um, through Zoom. Okay, those those are the paid. If you're not a member, we ask for a donation of ten dollars. But our first Mondays are always run by somebody from within the club or a friend of the club, right? Um, and sometimes they're I say sometimes they're better than our guest speakers. <laughs> like tonight, yes. Yeah. I'm I'm put, I'm putting Ken on the spot right now, but um, really are. I really am. But uh, keep in mind if you would I'm by the door. If he's by the door, he's leaving already. Uh, remember, if you're willing to step forward, serve on the board or some other position, or you have some ideas on how to improve our presentations, we could use technical. Uh, a technical team uh, for our Zoom. Uh, I know Ivan. Ivan is planning an on-site presentation in January, so that's going to be exciting. He's going to be doing his microscopic crystal January eighth. Okay, so we're going to be leaving, not leaving, but we're going to be taking the show on the road with one of our one of our good uh, members here. And that should be a lot of fun because you have your microscopes you can demonstrate. You can have your gallery over there. Uh, so that should be fun. We, we're we're working out the details to see if we can zoom from location. If not, it might be an in-person only meeting like the old days. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But keep 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 in mind that we are going to meet through the winter, <clears throat> and if we do have a weather delay or some bad weather, uh, we will post that first on Facebook. We'll post on Meetup, and we'll send out a, we'll send out an email. Uh, the the that the day before okay okay i'm going to turn it over to ken <clears throat> ken how long have you been a member he doesn't know he doesn't remember it's been so long um I that, remember it's pre jenny pre jenny okay pre jenny pre bob okay so that's a while ago I okay think kim was here when when i came you already were here yeah, and and some some of the people are shaking their head. Yeah, he was already here. He was in the building when they opened it. No, um, a lot of a lot of the people who remember and, and Ken can speak about this better than I. It was all film, and slides more particularly slides and film, and uh, they had the they had the lab at the at the building and everything like that. The dark room was there. The dark room was there. Uh, now our dark room is all in yeah. Photoshop, um, and film has coming back and i just said that a couple people know who's bringing back are the kids yeah. the younger group yeah. so 
So if we start getting back in the film, maybe we'll attract more younger people. Who knows? All right, I'm going to hand it over to Ken. Right. Actually, put this in your pocket. Okay. And clip clip this up here. All right. So remember, is there. that loud enough or too loud, Marshall? Are you just monitoring that? Yeah, I'm pretty good. That's good. okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. Oh, right. Jimmy, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm not talking too loud or too soft. How's the sound, you Jerry? That's Jay. Yeah. Jay, can you hear me? Yeah, it sounds great to me. <clears throat> okay. Hey, we're going to share your screen. Yeah. All right. Where do I need to stand? Then we need to switch. Oh, Jay, you're going to have to allow us to share screen. Okay. Well, why don't you click on that? <laughs> so I just hit the space bar then, right? Yeah, there it is. One click. Try it again. One there you go. I got to share the screen, so. It's over in your pocket. I know. Okay. Is that what you think? Isn't no. technology fun? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's not sure. No. There's... <laughs> Okay. Okay. No. Wait, wait. There, there, there. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why is the don't what, what does Jay see? I see um, your slides on the left, and in the middle, I see film is not dead, it's alive and growing. Oh, so we're seeing the whole. You just have to go to full screen on your presentation. I did? No, you didn't. No, go to the slideshow menu. Out there. So Resume done. slideshow, I guess. You can swap the screen. What's the We're okay. Yes. Yeah. It's neat to go to the slideshow. That one and then say under view. I'm beginning on the left. On the left, it's a lot of that. Oh, why is it? Let's try it again. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to use it on your screen, Bob. There's a little bit of stickers over here. Yeah, I don't know. Where is it? Oh, this one. Come over to this one. Look it off here, and there'll be a switch. If you want to switch this screen with that screen, but Zoom thing's probably out of the way. No, he sees it. They see it. They see. They that. see that. We Where? want to see the. You want to see that? Yeah, no, just no, one no, slide. No. This is the speaker view. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I'm confused. <laughs> well, Jay, Jay, can you see? Can you see my cursor? Uh, yes. Yes, I can see you going around in a circle. <laughs> we see the left panel. Yeah, we see the left panel with all the slides. I think somehow you've yeah, got to go to full slide if you can. Can you go under view? Usually it's down in the bottom right there. The bottom right. No, that's what they're stuck. <laughs> right there. Doesn't that work? We don't have enough yet. Settings to another PowerPoint. That's not what you want to do. Okay. That's <laughs> sorry, Ken. That's okay. It was all nice and big. I can show you a page at a time, but <laughs> I by this button right here, slideshow starts. That should work. This takes it back. 
can you go, I mean, the one in the top on the red, go all the way to the top bar menu. Yeah, maybe if you. <laughs> Minimize that one, Jimmy. Can you do the right of that? That fits the window? That's the editing window. We want to start slideshow with just that. It's not starting. Well, yeah. okay. Well, here. Or this one. Yeah. How about this? What's this? Stop, stop sharing on Zoom for That just zooms the page. Yeah. Sorry. All right. I guess everybody hears me and we don't see anything. We see the whole room. Okay, who's from out of town? I'm trying. I can do. No. Well, I think we could do the New Jersey tax instead. Or get a move. Get this eventually. I know it was up That's all right. Yeah, let's do it. Anybody besides me shoot pen tax? Did anybody besides me ever, ever shoot pen tax? Um, what did you shoot? I'm sorry. What camera? In other words, Pentax, uh, yeah. ME, Pentax K1000. Boring, boring, boring. I'm sorry? I think it K7. Oh, the K70. That's a um, digital, though. Film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Film, yeah. yeah. Because the K1000 was one of the cameras that most students used in school because it was cheap and basically very straightforward to use. So that's, I was just curious if anybody ran across that. Do you have a way to do it? Go for it. We had it up, and now I don't know understand why. It's yeah, it was working. Yeah. We want to go all the way back out and restart. That's what we're going to do. Oh, we did that. We did X out of it. Oh, okay. We opened it up again, but I hear they're still upstairs. The yeah. Glee Club. I'm yeah. Still upstairs. I do not do that. They're not singing yet. Well, we know film is not dead. Yeah. yeah. We know that. <laughs> yeah. Double click on the first slide. Does that make a difference? Start slideshow. You just make it start. There we go. Yeah, sure. There you go. Yeah. Jay, what do you see? Right now, I I see you guys all standing at the computer. <laughs> now it's full screen. Go for it. Yeah. Go ahead, it's working. Film is not dead. We already established that, right? Okay. Now, hopefully, when I push the button, it doesn't move. So which one do I need? The arrow key? That's not working. <laughs> anyway, while he's doing that, just basically, I've been shooting film since the 1970s in the last seven or eight years. I had the pleasure of spending two years in the Navy floating across the Pacific Ocean to Japan. And of course, anybody who's been to Japan in the service knows one thing. Everything there was cheap. 
So you could get a camera, you could get a car, you could get stereos, all kinds. And we, in the ship, we spent a lot of money in the uh, PX or the Naval Exchange at the time. And I bought my first camera, a film camera, that wasn't any of those disposables, called a Petri or a Petri, sort of like Dick Van Dyke's name. Ah, how did you do that? <laughs> I, I will, I'll advance it. All right. And I got back into film after being in digital for a number of years because I had read a lot about it. I thought it was interesting. I know it was dying and I figured, well, I better do it before it's gone. And I bought a K1000 on eBay, which is a very interesting issue. We can talk about that a little bit later. Are you able to move that forward? Okay, good. All right. If you want to go back, how do I go back to the other screen? There we go. Good. I have some notes. Do you want that? Yeah, you want your notes, right? Okay. Again, as I was saying, so I've been in shooting film. Basically, I started shooting both color and black and white. And I had my film developed at Moto Photo. And that is a plug for Sherry so that she realizes that we are plugging her. And she could not do 120 correctly. I ended up buying a medium format camera and I was one of the few people that brought it in for developing and she had to buy a, a mask as they call them to properly frame the 120 film because it's basically six by four or whoever type of camera you have. It could be six by six, it could be different sizes. And we'll get into some of that a little bit later. But I started shooting a lot of different films all using a lot of different cameras, many of which you'll see on the slide presentation. Now, as I do this, please ask questions. This could be very boring if all we see is slides and it's just me talking. And those of you who've known me in the past know I can talk and I will talk. So much to the point that Joel one time, and some of you may know Joel, had to say, Ken, you only had 20 minutes and it's now been a half an hour. So I can do it, but I don't want to have just myself talking all the time. So if questions come up or observations or some of your experiences, please, you're not interrupting me. It's going to add to the discussion because stories about film from the old days really are interesting and fun. And I've had a lot of fun shooting film. And really, I've had a lot of fun developing it, which is a whole other issue. And I've had film come out clear, and I've had it come out perfect. So it can be a real challenge. And we'll go over a little bit of that. So I do the arrow down. Oh, just real quickly, film is not dead. And one, some statistics very to start out with Kodak film sales have more than doubled between 2015 and 2019. I couldn't find any uh, figures after that for the year. And because of that, they've actually had to start recruiting technicians to make film. After all the people that they used to have, they laid them off years ago, decades ago in a sense, they now have to go out and try to recruit. And apparently the training for those positions takes a long time. It's a very technical, very precise operation. And it's all controlled by computers, basically. And that is a whole other uh, presentation in and of itself, watching how they make film. Film sales around the world in 2021 totaled, get it right, 4.6 billion. So it's not just in the United States, it's a worldwide phenomenon. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the regrowth of in, or interest in film started with a company called Lomography, if anybody's ever heard of them. They make a lot of different films. And what they basically do is they take film and they do different things to it. They put a purple haze on it, and then they also have uh, programs or they make suggestions through their websites and so forth of things you can do to film to give you different effects. 
such as one person said he threw it in a creek after he developed it and or not after he developed but after he shot it exposed it he put it in the creek for a while and got it soaking wet and then developed it and you would see all these different splotches all over the film it was creative they do a lot of very creative things and that's why you also have heard of Holga cameras. We'll get into that a little bit too. They have purposely designed light leaks. And let's move on. We'll get into um, Holga in a little bit. Okay, what we're going to talk about in this sequence is film, cameras, developing, scanning, and then a little bit on printing and a little bit on scanning, actually, because that you can do all the top three yourself or send it out. The scanning and the printing is if you want to get into it on your own. So we'll talk about that as well. Film, oh, wow, it shows a box on there. Common film sizes, this is what you can buy that fit the majority of cameras that are out there. Even some of the old cameras, some of the old brownie box cameras will take 120 film. A lot of them take 116 and other different sizes. When Marshall has a chance, he has a list of every single Kodak size that ever was used. You can just pass it around and look and it tells you what camera it went to. Kodak wasn't the first with film. There were a lot of people in Europe who developed the art of photography and filmmaking and developing film. But Kodak made it a commercial success for the average person. So therefore, they were starting to be able to designate, OK, if you're going to build a camera, I'm only going to make 120 film. Things like that occur. As an example, the only difference between 120 and 620 is the fact that Kodak wanted to make a proprietary camera that nobody else's film could fit. So 120 film or 620 film is nothing but 120 film on a skinnier roll. So it won't fit. 120 film won't fit in a 620 camera. It just It's just that small enough that it won't go in. So Kodak tried that. It didn't work. So they did make, and a lot of people did make 620 cameras, and there's a lot of them out there. But... Kodak had a little bit of a failure in trying to monopolize that. Film is also made all over the world, not just the United States, which we think of as the primary. It's made in Japan, Fuji, obviously, along with JPH and a whole bunch of others. Great Britain, Ilford, if anybody knows that brand, Ilford, and also German. I think Ilford started as a German company. France makes film, Italy, Germany, Belgium, Ukraine, Russia, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Austria, and I'm sure there's others. Film types. The early film type was uh, orth orthochromatic. Okay, that's a mouthful. Nowadays, it's panochromatic. That's the standard film for black and white is panochromatic. And we're going to have to start differentiating here fairly soon as we go through this. Color and black and white obviously are very different. And the way in which they're made is different. And the way in which they're developed is different. And even within the black and white, it gets crazy in terms of the number of ways or number of uh, developers that are out there. The panochrome of oh, the I'm sorry, the orthochromatic is a green, it's sensitive to blues and greens, and it was very early on. And if I as I understand it, they couldn't get it to produce. Somebody eventually figured out how to make it not that sensitive. And it had to do with silent films. When they started getting out and getting into color, they started, they had to change the makeup and the old black and whites with the ortho film they could just throw makeup on your face and you look great when you shot in the panochromatic that didn't work so they had to change that and that's what happened all right let me just go and quickly i'm going to go through some of the film types 
Kodak Color Plus. And that's an image I took with Kodak Pro Image 100. It doesn't match up, but that is a film. All I did was develop it and scan it. That's Gettysburg, by the way, in case anybody was curious. This is Lamography, and they are more of a craft type film company. They're a little more expensive than some of the other standard black and whites. They do both black and white and color, but they're big. They're a relatively large in that niche market where you get to do different weird things with your film. Purple colored color film is weird. I'll say that I've shot it and it's weird. Oh, I missed one. It varies, it really does. Color is the most expensive and you're looking at $20 a roll for both 120 pretty much and 35. If you want to get into the other sizes like 620 or 220 and 220 is really nothing more than 120 doubled. It's just on the same roll without a paper backing and it's it really is no different, but it's a size that's out there. But you're talking black and white, you can get down to six, seven bucks a roll, particularly if you get some of the uh, Arista, for example, makes a film that's designed for the student market. So it's called Arista EDU specifically so that they can use it in schools. And it's about seven bucks a roll. But then if you want to get in, I'm sorry? For how many exposures? 24 or 36. They're, the prices in that range don't go up that much between 24 and 36. And some people don't make both. Other manufacturers only do 24 like film photography project a lot of their little craft films are only 24 exposure and they charge you almost as much as 36 but it's it's designed that they can get more because a lot of the film that they buy is end runs or discontinued film or specialty film that in many cases governments and particularly u.s government sells and then they take them they cut them down a lot of them are surveillance films that they cut down a lot of them are uh, specialty films that they also manufacture by adding color and stuff to it to create differences but they take the stock film and then average it some or not average but some of them also this is a iso 8 that's an ISO 8. I have shot ISO 1.8. I'm still waiting to develop it. I'm crossing my fingers that it actually works. Obviously, the lower the ISO number, the brighter it has to be. There has to be light. And some of them won't work with lights like this. You have to be daylight. 5,500 Kelvin or even you know higher so that you get that brightness. But this is part of that niche that they make. People will go out, use tripods, shoot different stuff. And this is extremely fine detail on the film because you've exposed it so long, plus it's sensitive like that. So that works. And then, like I said, there's 1.8, 25. There's so many ISOs. We're used to digitally shooting maybe 50, typically 100 or 200 or somewhere in that range on a normal basis. They make films that go down to 80, 25, 64. It's, as a matter of fact, the old Kodak films, 25. The old Kodaks. Go ahead, Ivan. ISO 8. What kind of shutter speed would require that? If you can meter it, it's, um, I've gone down as far as my camera can go to 1.8 if the lens has that. And then you're talking about uh, three, four, five seconds exposure at least. And that's trial and error. And the problem is you don't know it until you develop it. So you just, you, sh you shoot a roll, what I did a couple of weeks ago is I just went out back with one of these low ISO. Bright sunny day sat there and started just changing all the settings I could, watching the light meter to make sure that it was in somewhat of a semblance. And the problem is you're talking sometimes three, four, five 
different steps over what you would think in terms of exposure. It, it's very tricky. And once you master it, it's a lot of fun because of the fine detail that goes with that. Yes and no. Um, the problem is the I, ISO, oh, go ahead, Bob. Oh, okay. Um, Ivan was asking, what was it again? I forgot. The light meters on the cameras. The light meters on many of the old cameras like this one here, it's a 60 year old camera. It's the Pentax Spotmatic. This camera is 60 years old. The electronics in this a lot of times does not hold up. So you need to manually meter your film. So you're using a light meter? A handheld light meter. So you get your readings off of that. And even some of them don't go down to eight. And that's part of the problem. So if you get a 25, then you got to add like three more steps down to ex add the exposure. So you expose it enough. But it's a neat film. It's a, you know, this film, 10 bucks, 11 bucks, perhaps. It's a waste of 11 bucks if you don't do it right. But then you don't know. So you sit there with your list and you say, shot number one, I did F this with it this second. And you go back and when you've developed the film, you're able to see what was the settings that worked the best. What other questions? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. And this is just an example of FPP, the uh, Film Photography Project. There are the people I was talking about earlier that basically take old films. Sorry about that, Jay. All right, so ISO 200, it's a heavier grain. They, It's a grainier, some people like grainier film. And that's one of the things with black and white that is so much more challenging is the right word to develop than just simply color color is c41 102 degrees that's it there is only one way to develop a c41 kit there's only so many ingredients and it only works based on the instructions that come with the kit black and white has variations that could be scary at first, but once you, you find out and do it a couple of times, you can realize it's not that bad. It's also at 68 degrees, so it doesn't require heat. Color requires 102 degrees consistent when you develop the fixing and the stop baths and the final rinse can be within a range of temperatures, but the developing temperature has to be 102 degrees. That's the way the chemicals on the film are designed to work with the developer. Right. Oh, they're singing upstairs. And then Portra 160, again, 20 some bucks, maybe even more than that. Ilford, very good film. Uh, very competitive with the quality that you get from Kodak, T-Max, and so forth. There's a bunch of different varieties there. They even have a black and white film that you can develop in C41. Because if you cross develop black and white and color, you get some weird or no results. So that's something you don't want to make sure. And you also, if you, we'll get to that, but you don't want to mix your chemicals either. And this is an Ilford Delta 100, and that's something I so Slide film, very, used to be really popular. As we talked about earlier, all the presentations in the old club back in the 50s and so forth were in slides. This is about the only slide film that you can consistently get right now. And it's about 26 bucks a roll. 
when I was in the service, that's all I shot was slide film because slide film was all over the place. It was cheap to develop. It wasn't necessarily cheap to buy the film, but it was cheap to develop. So I shot slides everywhere I went when I was in the service. Now it's very hard to get. Well, and very expensive. So Ken, question. Yes. Uh, when I was in Germany, which was in the late 60s, they had a very good film. In fact, I like it better than Kodak, and that was Agfa. Have you ever used Agfa? Has anyone used it? Really good film. Yeah. The saturation and the punch to it was terrific. Agfa is... I, you, I've shot that because, and again, in the service, you buy cheap film. But AGFA right now is, they've been out of business, I think, twice. They've been bought twice by different people, and they do produce some stuff. But I think their film production right now is not, it's branded AGFA, but I, meet, I believe it's made by somebody else. Uh, FOMO Pan if you've ever heard of that, is a film, I believe it's Czechoslovakian, and it makes private label film for a lot of different people. The Arista EDU is form of hand. It's not, it's not anything different than relabeled their film. So if you look at developing times between those films, the 100, the 200, the 400 are all, everything is identical. It's the same film. So, and believe it or not, as Marshall and I were talking about, there is a black and white positive or called a slide reversal film that ADOX makes, ISO 50. So it requires a lot of sunlight. I bought a few rules of this recently and I've been shooting it, trying, and I'm waiting because chemicals aren't cheap to get enough rolls that I can go through and develop a bunch of rolls at the same time. Chemicals have a shelf life, some of them longer than others. So you have to be careful because they can be expensive. I believe the reversal chemical developing kit for this is about 50 bucks. So you have to make it worth it. Go ahead, Ivan. That could be. For yeah, uh, Ivan wants to know if it's cheaper to send the film out to a place like Walmart, for example, or even a regular place like Moto Photo. It can be. It can be cheaper, but you lose control of the film. If you're going to be just a casual film taker and you want to use a camera to shoot family events, take it anywhere that's inexpensive, get your prints done, and you're fine. I mean, there's no reason for you to get involved as I have gotten to the extreme I've gotten unless you want to do that as a hobby, unless you find that. it To initially start, and we'll get into this a little more later, there is some upfront, upfront costs that you have to pay. And then once you get that out, your per role developing costs can be very, very affordable. And we'll I want to talk about that a little bit towards the end. Anybody else? And I got to remember. Film, yes, does have a shelf life. That was the question. Does film have a shelf life? Yes, it does. And there's a whole group of people out there that shoot expired film and pay a whole bunch of money for expired film because things happen. Color film, you get color shifts once it's really passed. And you can get color shifts in color film for things like leaving your roll of film on the back dash window of your car for three hours in a hundred degree temperature, you might get color shifts. In other words, it's sensitive to that kind of stuff. But people love taking it. You can, I'm trying to remember exactly the formula, you can take for every 10 years, it's basically lowering your camera by one F stop or raising it, depending on which way you want to go with it. So it, it, it does expire. It does change the quality of the film, but you can adjust for it because there's enough people out there that have done it. Black and white film, people have shot black and white film 10 years after, have done nothing different to the film and it comes out perfect. 
Black and white is more stable than color film. So that works that way. This is the newest film on the market, not the newest per se, but the most popular right now, Vision 3. It's movie film. A lot of your popular movies, and I should have written down the list, a lot of movies are shot on Vision 3 by Kodak. And all they do is take the film from Kodak, cut it to 35 millimeter film, and you use it in your camera. There's a couple of conditions to go with that though. It has a backing to it that's a carbon I a carbon type of backing because it's used for high speed transfer. And of course, as you're shooting film, the film is moving very quickly. And without this background, what you end up with is light flashes in the film white spot you know sparks in the film because it's moving so quickly so this carbon product on the bottom on the very bottom of the film eliminates that it's a halation layer and i think i forget the remjet that was what i was on remjet layer developing it has a couple of extra steps because you have to get rid of the remjet layer on the back of the film the advantage to it it's cheap, it's half the price of color film right now, if you can get it. It's so popular now that it's selling out very fast because it's half the price. And you can cross process that film in C41 or in what they call ECN2, which is the developer you have to use but you get different colors, not negatively different, but if you were to look at the two of them, the same shot developed, you would notice that, oh, this is a little brighter, this is not. It does look like film you would see in a movie theater. It has that kind of color backing. And then of course, the sheet film for any of those people that shoot the large format cameras, which is the old press cameras and so forth. And there's a number of people, if anybody follows uh, the Burks photography, there's a, uh, I forget the name of it. There's a guy called Greg Opst. He specializes in large format film. And it's really neat because the larger the film, the more detail. So in other words, when you're looking at a, at a 110, okay? Everybody knows what a 110 looks like. And if you look at the negative, even better yet, the old wheel ones, which are even, you need a microscope to see if you have a picture. There's less detail in there. As you, if you blow that up, what you end up seeing is a lot of pixelization as we call it now. Media, large format is like those old Civil War black and whites, where if you look at them, the detail is so incredible. And that's what this does. It's a bigger space. It's the same idea as medium format DSLRs, full frame DSLRs, APC. They just get better on the way up. Yeah, well, we wanna know, Ivan's asking if it's individual. Yes, it's one sheet. So you put them in, there's a, a holder that goes in that has to be unexposed to the light. So you have to pack them in a dark room and then you take the picture, expose it, pull it out with the same frame and then you put another one in. Instant film is very, very popular. Fuji is one of the big ones right now. They have all those little mini cameras and other cameras, not the same size as Polaroid. However, Polaroid, in spite of anything you may have heard, is alive and well and making new cameras. They just came out with a new camera a month or so ago that 
allows you to do f-stops, speeds, anything and everything. However, you're not going to pay 89 bucks for it. $600. It promises the best quality instant of any camera that's been made. So if you're into instant photography, you don't have to worry about developing or anything else. Just take the picture and there you go. But it is expensive, but it is a much better quality camera in terms of that. Over 50 brands of film can be bought. Anything around for still film, any kind, and that includes the Instamatic types or the instant types, 50 brands. And if you want to look, I've got some up here that you, that film, but a list of all of them. It's incredible, but is available to shoot. Anything and everything, if you want to try to be a little different, you want red film, when they make color film, they stack the color sensitivities. And on the bottom is red. So what this one company does, which is the Film Photography Project, they re-roll the film backwards. So the red's on top. So that when you take a picture, the first sensitivity is red. So the film has the red hue to it as you develop it. So, I mean, again, that's a little more expensive. You're talking, you know, 14, 15 bucks, maybe 19, I should say for that. But there's a lot of different films out there so that you could find something. That company helps you make the model back to Cine still. They, they want to know about a mono. I'm going to get to the mono bath developer. That's a great little tool. Movie film, in case anybody has any of those old eight millimeter, 16, 35 millimeter cameras out there. Yes, you can buy film form. They're out there. Mainly film photography project that has it. They make new film. You go on eBay, I can't guarantee that what they're selling you is new film. But that is available, Film Photography Project, in different sizes on top of it. So if you have a Super 8, it might be limited availability, but there may be film. Of course, then you got to find somebody to develop it. And a lot of places don't develop movie film. However, there are some I'll give you towards the end companies that you that might do something like that. There's big developing companies, there's about three or four of them around the country that you can use. They're not cheap, but they're good. It's not Walmart. I'm sorry. That's the type of company that I'm not really on. I'm sure you practice too, but a lot of people are saying that the sales of this is really expensive. Again, I remember 10 years ago when I was the majority of my back. Got to get to the yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. For everybody in the uh, Zoom audience, what Maria is basically asking is there's a dichotomy in her mind. I'm saying that film is growing, yet when she went to a local store, she had difficulty finding what she needed. I'm not going to, I don't want to say anything negative about Moto Photo. I know Sherry and, but Moto Photo is here. DNH camera is here. What they can carry in their inventory is nowhere near what BNH can or Cardinal Camera perhaps or Dan's. Okay. She's more into selling prints, 
doing developing and so forth she, she da can't carry everything that some of the others can yeah. yeah online is also a very i mean bnh is online i had a ramas online freestyles online i mean you pay seven bucks shipping you can get about anything you want within five days or less yes so and again that was a question about shipping but yeah you really need to look, you know, if you start to get in, interested and involved in photography, you need to start looking at where can I go to source what I need. And Moto Photo is a great place for developing. It really is. She does an excellent job. She will do whatever she can to do whatever you ask. But again, it's a smaller operation. It's really a one person operation with two or three employees. And I'm not knocking it. She has a very good store where can you buy film cameras we talked about a bunch of them already there's a few that i haven't mentioned i mean we said adorama bnh ebay and i'll talk about ebay in a second keh is an excellent place they are good to buy your cameras and good to sell you cameras. I'm sorry? Yeah, no, they will sell. I'm sorry, the question was K&H K only or KEH only used? No, it, they sell new. These other places sell, well, for example, Use Photo Pro sells used cameras, but they are a subsidiary of Robert's Cameras who sells everything. So, Use Photo Pro is another one. I can recommend to you, if you buy from either KEH or Use Photo Pro, and there's a couple others out there in the country, I don't know their names, but I buy from Use Photo Pro the most and I bought from KEH and their product is good. If they say to you, it works, it works. There is no question about that. And if it doesn't, there is no question about returning it and getting a full refund. They are very good. They stand behind their stuff. The only difference in why I don't buy more from KEH, use Photo Pro will show you pictures, multiple, six, seven, eight, of the exact camera you're buying. KEH only shows stock photos. So if you're trying to judge, even though KEH gives you a very excellent description, if you're trying to judge whether or not you want to buy that camera, Use photo is better because you can see all the dents, all the scratches. They give you a little better explanation. They may rate it at good quality like KEH may, but they'll also tell you needs seals or light meter doesn't work on the really old ones. So you know what you're getting before you buy it. They're very good. There's others around the country that do that. But those are the ones that I had mentioned. Now, types of cameras. Obviously, I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures of different cameras. We'll go through them pretty quickly if you have questions. But there are new film cameras that are called toy cameras. Because up to this point, and I'm saying up to the up to yesterday, there were no film. SR and SLR new cameras coming out. If you want to buy a camera, you're buying a point and shoot film camera that is more than likely a toy. And I don't mean you give it to your three year old to use. It's just the name that's attached to the fact that it's not, you know, something like this or a Nikon or a Canon. It's purposely designed who have light leaks in them. So you have different effects on your film. They use plastic lenses. They're usually a fixed lens. You only have sunny, cloudy, and bulb if they have bulb. So there's not a lot of options, but it's fun to experiment with them. It says up there that Pentax has started work on a new film camera 
as of last night, they are announcing that in spring of 2024, they are going to release two different film point and shoot cameras. And following that will be at least one SLR. So Pentax is, people laugh at Pentax because it's not Nikon or Canon. And Pentax is like the seventh or sixth largest filmmaker or camera maker now. It was never that way. There were times back in the 50s and 60s, Pentax was the camera brand you bought. In one year, this camera, the Spotmatic, outsold every single Canon and Nikon camera made. I'm not saying that roles haven't switched because they have. But Pentax just also came out with a Pentax monochrome camera for about $2,300. If you want to buy a monochrome only camera, you know how much you're going to pay? Eight, ten thousand dollars for a Leica. Not to say that a Leica isn't a good camera or good quality, but they do, you pay a lot for that. And now Pentax. So they're trying to hit niche markets that other manufacturers there are no longer doing. So as of yesterday, they announced that that was happening. So very quickly, let's go through some examples of the types of cameras. You have the digital full frames. You have medium formats. I love this camera. I own this camera. I think it's, it's unbelievable for me. It's really good. 645, it's a Pentax 645. So it's six by four and a half mm's, if that's- Yes, it's 120, it shoots. Anything that's medium format is always going to be 120, 220, 620. The sheet film is large, but you're basically, that's medium format. And again, because it's a larger film, it gives you more detail than the 35. Again, just like you're looking at your sensors. One, 120 millimeters? No. 120. Yeah, the question is, yeah, just call it 120, just call it 35. People call it 120 mm, but if you look at the camera nerds, they tell you no. You know, it, it's not 120 exactly, but it that's just the way it's been named and it's come down that way. Range finders are also neat cameras. They're not SLRs, but they're a really neat camera. And they were the camera that everybody used prior to SLRs. They're nice. You have to, I'm sorry, I'm moving out of camera. You're actually looking through that. So if you're looking at that and the lens is over here, okay, you have to realize that that's what's gonna happen to your picture. But that was neat. And there were tons of rangefinder cameras very good quality rangefinder cameras out there. And you can buy them. Yeah. I hate to say eBay, but you can find rangefinders on eBay a lot. Well, Ken, actually for the rangefinder camera, when you got into close focusing, in the view screen itself, there was guidelines to give you a correction so that you weren't getting something off, you know, and right. like that, it's not going to be on your film. Okay, what Marshall is just saying is within the rangefinder, if you're coming in real close, it does show you how and helps you to actually focus correctly on a closer object. Medium format 620 film cameras. Now, when you guys, cause, okay, I'm not going to insult anybody, but I'm assuming a lot of you are around my age. And when I had aunts, uncles, cousin, my parents, whenever they had film cameras, they looked like this or the brownie. They were medium format also, but this is 620. This is Argus, a very good camera, very popular, sold very well. 
they were they did keep the 620 format that Kodak established and they used it. A lot of cameras did. Vintage cameras. I have a couple like this and I've shot a couple of them. And they, if you get the right film, again, you have to make sure it's 120 or whatever film you can buy. But it's, it's, they're a little harder to use. They're a little more expensive to buy because they become collector items. And people will pay for cameras that don't work because they want to put it on their shelf. So sometimes you pay a little more for something like this than it's really worth. Particularly a lot of these, uh, you have problems with the, I'm not gonna move, <laughs> problems with the bellows as they call them. They will crack over time and light gets in there. So even if you have one that works, they may not give you really good pictures because of all the light leakage, but they're neat to have on your shelf. What about molding them in? Okay. Molding cameras, mold. Mold. mold you can well i've seen mold on everything from lenses to cameras you have to watch what you're buying you have to be careful and that's why you need to see pictures of what you're buying okay four by sheet filth uh yeah four by five sheet filth ca cameras the large and large format. A lot of these, that's a, a type of a camera there that you see people doing the Civil War pictures with. They'll use that. 3D cameras. Okay, I'm going to ask again, anybody remember the, let me get to it. I got to get to it. Oh, it's not on here. Um, Stereo Realist, very popular camera, 3Ds. In the 50s, when 3D movies came out, an inventor decided he wanted to produce a camera that people could buy and shoot 3D pictures. And what you do is you see on this particular one, which is the Kodak version, there are three sensors you see there there's two lenses and then your sensor that you are not the sensor but the viewfinder so to speak so when you're aiming it's taking two pictures now somebody's looking and going wait a minute they're spread apart quite a bit yes they are the way the film is generated particularly with kodak was that every third or yeah every third picture was different fourth picture so you would take a picture here and a picture here and in between were two other pictures. So then you would advance and then you got, so when you get the role developed, you then have to go back if you're doing it yourself and match up the pictures. What was hopefully intended was that you would get a mailer with the film because there was special film for this. You would send it to Kodak, they would produce slides for you and send it back. But the Realist was a camera that was heavily, not this one, but the Realist heavily advertised. It was the number one 3D camera, was made until the 90s. It was advertised by people such as Fred Astaire, John Wayne, Doris Day, Bob Hope, James Cagney. He paid these people to do full page magazine ads in like the post and so forth with them hanging on to the camera and saying it's a great camera to use. And it became an extremely popular camera and was sold very well. It outsold everybody. Yes. And one question here, and I believe I'm, I've heard this somewhere that actually the distance between the two lenses almost like the distance between the eyes. And so that's what gave you the stereo effect. I I can't, okay, he asked about the distance between the camera lenses and the distance between the eyes. That probably is true. I can't speak to that specifically. 
but I've read that too. So, all right. But it's an e-camera. I own this one and I've shot with it and it needs a cleaning. So I get so many dust specs, it's almost... Oh, did I miss toy cameras? Oh, I miss toy cameras. It's not... Oh, there are disposables. We got the instant cameras. I talked about Kodak. Or not Kodak, Polaroid. Polaroid is owned by a company in Europe. It's not even an American company anymore. Disposable cameras are still there. You can still buy them. 110 cameras. Yeah. With the flash bulb sticking up. You know why they did that? Red eye. They were, if you put it right on, you could still put the flash cube right on, but you'd get red eye. If you took it up over a certain level, that got rid of the red eye. Toy cameras, again, this is a Holga. There's others uh, that Lomo makes, Lomography, which are called Dianas. And there's a bunch of others out there. Holga was a Chinese company that basically made these to be sold to the mass market in China. People who couldn't afford cameras. They were made cheaply, hence the light leaks. And I don't, when I read intentionally, they didn't make it that way for photographic effect. They just made them cheaply. <laughs> but they became interesting because of the light leaks and so on and so forth. The company went out of business. Today, you can buy Holga cameras, new, brand new Holga cameras, because somebody bought it. But the problem was they had a line, I mean, a very extensive line of cameras. And when the owner went out of business, he broke just about every mold he could get his hands on. And there were some molds that were saved, and they're the ones that are being used. And there were also, the company that owns them now is also making other cameras. But basically, this Holga camera was the only mold left from what I read. So it's in a, but it is a toy camera. It, it's very limited plastic lens. Again, sun clouds bulb. You don't have a lot of options, but it's fun to play with if you don't. I mean, you can go out, get pictures of the family. I can't guarantee you'll like the results. However, if you want to play interesting games, it's a good camera to try. This is a neat little camera. I, I use this one occasionally. It's called the Sprocket Rocket. It's a toy camera. It does have some light leaks on it. But what it does, okay, let me take a step back. Film. The sensitivity to the film goes from the bottom. Goes from the bottom of the film to the top of the film. So when you take a picture, the camera itself, if you've ever looked in the back of a film camera, it exposes the portion between the sprockets. The sprocket rocket allows the film to be exposed completely from edge to edge. So occasionally, if you've ever seen, and there's other ways you can do that, and there's other uh, pictures that you can do but people I've seen them used very effectively in ads not the camera but the concept of the sprockets but this camera does it and it the, the problem with this camera again it's very limited in terms of sunny cloudy you know near and far it's the toy camera in that sense but you need to shoot 400 plus film on that because it has to be, you know, more sensitive to light. But that's, it's a neat little toy camera to play with. And this is kind of the result you get. And again, you can, this one is a little overexposed because of the problems and getting a real good picture, but that's what it looks like. I'm sorry? Scan it print it. She wanted to know how you would get it printed. You scan it and print it. If you take it to a developer and you tell them you want these done this way, they will print them that way.
very quickly, movie cameras. Again, they can be bought online. eBay, and I haven't done my eBay speech yet. Okay. Now to the, this is the fun part in my mind. This is where I get fun, developing. If anybody tells you that the first roll of film that you develop, you might as well figure you can chuck it and throw it out, they're wrong. First roll of film I ever developed following the instructions for C41 worked perfect. It came out, it was beautiful. I couldn't believe it. I was expecting nothing and it came out. You can do all this at home without a darkroom. It's very easy to do. You have to remember the steps. You have to want to do it, okay? In the sense, buying the equipment, stuff like this, which is a Patterson tank. This is a one reel Patterson tank. You need a dark bag or a dark room, which most of us aren't going to have a dark room, but this is a dark bag. You basically put everything into it and you put the film onto the reels, but it's all done in here, in the dark. You have hands, you see these, you have the hands, you put them in, it's elastic, it really works, it keeps it dark. It's double zippered, so you have an inner zipper and an outer zipper to keep light seals out. This is about 30 bucks. So you see, this is about 30 bucks for this size, 30 bucks. You can see right away, just in two things, you're starting to spend a little bit of money. But you, number one, if you have it, the money, and I'm not saying everybody can, if you have it and you're interested, you can think of the initial expenses as really being prohibitive. Because if you continue with it, if you continue with it, then the costs cut out over each roll. And before you know it, you're saving and charge and being cost about five to seven dollars a roll. And I guarantee you that you can't do that pretty much now anywhere. Okay. Some basic tools that you need. And I, I'm not going to go into how you develop that. That is an entire evening in and of itself. Changing bag. As a matter of fact, you can actually buy a walk-in darkroom by, from Ilford for um, 200 bucks. It folds and then you blow it up. It's got all those silly, not blow it up, but it's got all those silly metal rods up and down that holds it in shape. You zipper it behind you and you go in and it's totally darkness. You can do, but it's a little, it's a little more comfortable. And I believe it has a little table in it that you can set stuff on. Because in here, I can guarantee that this and all its corresponding parts, plus the film, plus the scissors, plus everything else you need to get the film from here to here. And let me see if I can do this. I'm gonna show up. Yes, you practice. You're gonna do what I did when I first started is that you basically buy the cheapest, oldest, rottenest roll of film you can do and you practice and you practice and then you can do it like this, this quick. That's all, and then you take it in the bag, you put it in and then you of course pour the chemicals and develop and everything. But it's all done in the bag. You just need to practice. Somebody, go go ahead. Oh, okay. So it can be done. It's a lot of fun. But again, my caution is, as the question was earlier, you can send it out cheaper, but you lose control. And to go on a little bit more with this, 
you need the tank, which you just saw. This actually is a two reel tank. You can buy these tanks, they're called Patterson tanks. They're plastic and you can buy them up to five rolls of film. You can also buy tanks that can be not only the five roll, but can develop medium format, or I'm sorry, large format film. They have special inserts where you put the sheets in there and you develop them as you would anything else. This is a unique little item, lab box. It's based on a German design from the 40s and 50s made in Italy. You can develop this in the middle of the park, brightest sunshine, 100 degrees, and you can develop it because everything in there is light sealed. You take the roll of film, you put it in the middle one where you see that's for 35. You hook it up to a reel that's in the front. You wind it, you put the cover over, you wind it up. When you get to the end and you get the resistance, there's a button underneath, you push it, it cuts the film. And then you can develop it from there without taking anything else out. It's really wild. It can be done, but it's one roll at a time. And if you shoot a lot of rolls like I do, this is not real time in essence. It's called the Lab Box. It's made by a company in Italy. And it's you can buy it at Freestyle and a number of other places if you're curious. It's a great little tool for starting. The, the basic kit can run you about 140 bucks, not cheap. If you buy the 120 insert, you're probably up to 179, 180. And something like that would be good if you're out and you have to see exactly what you're shooting and you want to do it right away without going back and getting to a dark room or back or anything. Yeah, the question is that's something you want to use out there. Yes, that's true, but you can also do it if you only want to develop one roll of film. And it's it's very easy, it's not as messy. And I'm gonna go back to a point that was made mono bath. If you put in a black and white film, use mono bath, you're done developing within six minutes and all you have to do is rinse and apply photo flow and you're done. The photo flow is to allow the film to dry better. It's like a soap, it, it just causes the water to run off the film a little better. <laughs> But mono bath is the fixer, the stopper, and the developer all in one. It's only good for certain films. There's only certain black and white films you can use it on. It's an extensive list, but not every film can be done with mono bath. But it's neat that you can use this with mono bath. Is where I first started with mono bath. I tried it out on this. It works really neat. That with color is a little tough because of the second, because of the, not the fixer, but yeah, the fixer, not for the developer. Fixer is heat. And when you mix it, it starts to expand. So if you put in a, you know, 500 milliliters in there, it leaks because it becomes a little more than 500. So you have to adjust it. Okay, these are reels. The one I had is a cheater reel, so to speak. If you buy a Patterson tank, it comes with a reel that looks like that, except the lip is very small. This is a, a, a wheel, yeah, a reel I got from B&H, and it has a very long feeder to it. It makes it so much easier. So when I'm standing up here and I was putting that on, you can see how big that is as opposed to the size it would have been, which would have probably been just about that. And that takes a little longer and a lot more practice to put in. So, thermometers for uh, color development, again, because it has to be 102 degrees, along with slides and along with cine still, uh, the, 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 I'm sorry, 
film, movie film, that has to be developed at a higher temperature. So anything that's color, you need a higher temperature for. I'm gonna to get to that in a second. He asked, how do I warm it up? You need gloves, You're dealing with chemicals. If you don't wear glasses, safety glasses are also something you want. And even if you have safe glasses, you may want safety glasses or goggles. Scissors, because you're gonna to have to cut it. You need to measure to mix the chemicals. You need to open the canister, the film canister. And you can use a bottle opener or this tool, which is, I've never used a bottle opener. I've used this and it works great. Storage bottles for the chemicals, because more than likely you're not going to develop the full packet strength of your developer. These are accordion. You want that because you don't want air. So as you put the developer in there, you push it down so the liquid gets to the top. So the liquid does not or stays longer because it will run out. Distilled water. Anybody heard of hard water yeah. and all the stuff that's in it? Okay, that's why you use distilled water. Ivan, a sous vide. Seriously, this is what you use to maintain temperature for color film, slide film, or the this, this cinema film. And there, you can spend 30 bucks or 100 and 200 bucks for a sous vide. You don't need to go up there for that. Just get the cheapest one. As long as it can maintain temperature, you're okay. Chemicals. Again, chemicals should be handled safely away from children. You need to ensure that you cap them and take all the precautions. And the one precaution is you don't mix. Because I'll tell you right now, if you take any chemical, black and white or color, and you take the developer and it comes in contact, even with the least drop of fixer, for an example, it's done. They're very sensitive. So you, you have to wash your tank, in a sense, every time you use it so you don't have any of those residuals in there when you pour your developer back in. Because once you use the developer and pour it out, it doesn't matter, you don't have to wash it again because the other chemicals don't do anything to the developer at that point. But you don't want to contaminate your chemicals. This is just one of the more popular black and whites, HC110. Been around for ages, it's been reformulated, doesn't mean anything. You need to stop bath, a fixer, and a wetting agent. So if you're developing black and white, you use a black and white developer, fixer, stop, and wetting agent, and you're done. Just hang it up to dry. Color chemicals usually come in a packet. This one from CineStill, three, set, three packets. One developer and a fixer and the stop bath. These are about $25 for a kit. They'll do, depending on how many rolls you do and what size the roll, they'll do up to 10, 12 rolls if you're doing them back to back to back to back. If you do it the next day, you probably can do a couple more rolls. If you're doing it in two or three days, you can do, you wait a week or so, and I can promise you it starts to deteriorate and you will get color shifting and you may not even get development. Some developers work today, tomorrow, forget it, nothing. Slide chemicals, they contain more parts. Black and white, this is the one I mentioned earlier, 50 bucks. So again, when you, if you're doing this you try to accumulate as many rolls as you can before you start developing. Because I'll tell you right now, I've had developer go bad within the time frame that they say it shouldn't have. Because you store it. You got to store it in a dark bottle. You got to store it in a, you know, in a space that the temperature is somewhat controlled. <clears throat> sure, again, if you have the collapsible bottle that you don't have air. Some developers are single shot, 
some developers can be used over and over again, and some developers will love Wawa. And this is no joke. Half and all. People develop film, black and white film, and calf and all, which is basically coffee with some other ingredients in there that you have to have. People have also developed film with orange juice and other things. It all depends if, you know, people make their own homemade developers. There's a cookbook called the Film Photography Cookbook or something to that effect. Kodak put one out. There's a bunch of other people that put them out and tells you how to make developer using chemicals. Now, in the old days, the chemicals, you can't buy them today. Not because they're not available, because they're not going to sell them to you anymore. So developers now are made with less hazardous chemicals. Formaldehyde was a big chemical that was used in some of the developers in the past. So now they do. And this is ECN2. And with this one in particular, there are companies, Cine still is the one in particular that sells that Vision 3 film with the Remjet already removed. So you don't have to worry about that step. And that step is basically taking your exposed film, putting it in here, pouring in a combination of water and baking soda, shaking it vigorously for about a minute, dumping it out. And when you see it come out, it's as black as you can imagine. It's as black as those shirts. And you do that and then you can develop it in ECN2. You can also do that and develop it in C41 if you want. You just get a little different effect. But the Remjet has to come off. And you cannot take Cine Still Film to any developer, or not Cine, but the Vision 3 to any place like Motofoto, because when they're done developing it, you're going to get a call from their lawyer because you just wrecked their machine. <laughs> because the residual from that carbon is going to be all over their machine and they can't develop film until that machine is completely cleaned from top to bottom so there are certain photo labs throughout the country that will develop it or you develop it yourself all right thankfully we're hunting to the end yes It's the Remjet on the bottom. Remember I talked about the black on the, the uh, cinema film, the movie film. So it, it would stop the light sparks as they're taking the pictures. It's a black carbon on the base of the film. That's manufactured into it for specifically for movies. You would not get them to develop it. Okay, sorry. No, they would not do that. Yeah, there are two or three labs in the country that will do that for you and it's extremely expensive. Again, it's cheap to buy because it's half the price of color film. The film is. But then if you develop it with the Remjet on the bottom, you either do it yourself or you pay a lot of money to get it done. Or you buy Cine Still film, which is the same film, and they've already removed it. And then you can take it to Moto Photo and have them develop it. Or any other lab. It's because it has the Remjet removed. Yes, Marshall. Have you, in the past, when you have developed your own film, just for the fun of it, have you done solarization of the film? Okay, you mean putting it out in the sun? Yeah, in other words, you're just halfway through the development, and all of a sudden you just take it out, and you flip on the room lights, and you just spin it around like that, and then put it right back in the development. Um, it's interesting. Um, 
That's interesting. I'm trying to think there, I mean, there is a, a, a tool called stand development. And again, Marshall's asking about taking it, spinning it around in the light and doing, you can, depending on what you buy is a developer or the cine still, you actually have to pull it out and put it in the light. Okay, because that's just how their packet worked. Other people's work differently. But, I was just saying I did that with Triax. Just, yeah. just for the fun of it. You know. Yeah. This is interesting. That would be interesting. Yeah, I've never done that and spin it around. But stand developing is basically taking film and, and then shaking it up and leaving it set for about an hour. And it develops very slowly. You got to change the mixture and everything else to do that. Very quickly, we'll go through this because we're heading to the end. If you want to scan, there's a number of tools that you can do. So if you develop it yourself or if you send it out to get developed and they actually will give you the negatives back, which is not the case anymore. Question, where did the negatives come from? The developed film. So the film itself is actually the negative? I yeah. Like I'm the only one you don't have to repeat that question. <laughs> uh, for the tape, we'll bleep out that question. Uh, yeah, that was, but digital scan. Yes. Yeah. yeah, there's probably six people that were sitting out in Zoom land that wanted to know that answer too. Well, he didn't want his question. <laughs> yeah, somebody in the room asked where the negatives come from from the film, and it's basically the, basically the developed film. I don't have it. I should have brought one. I was going to bring one, and I forgot to show you because this is that film I was showing was already exposed. I can't shoot it anymore. It's been exposed to light. If I dipped it into a developer and pulled it out, you'd just all white or not white clear. And if I'm lucky, I would see the film numbers on the top and the other stuff on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Digital scanners, uh, if you want to do it yourself and if you do get your negatives back, you may want to rescan them because you didn't like the way they printed your pictures or all you asked for was to be developed and be, have your negatives back. So you can scan them yourself. Yes. Very old. Very old photos. Yeah. Okay. The question was for Maria, right? Lori, I'm sorry. Maria is oh, that one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The yes, you can do that because you need a special scanner, a digital photo scanner. These run anywhere from about 300 and some dollars to 12, 1300 dollars. They have a place to put a negative. Yeah, they're called masks. And I'm going to show you that as we come up. But you need a program. I'm sorry. Yes, they do. Yeah, you can do that. You can take negatives anywhere if you get them back. And a lot of places don't give them back. Yeah, are there any quality scanners out there that can pull the paper sheet? That's a good question. <laughs> Four by five was the question, four by five scanners. I don't know of any. I'm not saying they're not there. I believe some of the higher priced ones you may be able to, because what you need on a scanner is you normal scanners give you light on the bottom. You need a light on the top also. The more expensive scanners, I'm thinking of the Epson 850, is the whole scan. In other words, the top part is also a full light. Normally these, let me go back to that. This one has one little ridge down the middle for slides and or negatives. The 850, I believe, because it's a full thing, you probably could do that. But don't just research it. You can probably just go on eBay or someplace.
Okay, well then that one also then, yeah. Because as long as you can do two rows at once, you should be able to do the bigger negatives. Now, the software that goes with it might present a problem because the software is designed to look at certain sizes. So you may have to just put it on and scan it as is and then see how it comes off, throw it in the Lightroom or Photoshop and do all the stuff yourself. Because these scanners come with programs a lot of times and the programs will take your negative and turn it into a positive. So that would show you and you'll see what it turns out to be. View scan is more and more popular. Negative Lab Pro is a very in-depth program. It, it, you need to be really good to start using that one. Most of the scanners, Epson scan, Epson scanners comes with Epson scan, which is a basic program that will give you good, re, you know, resolution and a good picture from the negative. Um, Canon, I, I forget, they might have Silverfast and it's the same concept, but you need software. Some of the software comes free. Some of the software you have to buy, like Negative Lab Pro is not, that's a hundred and some bucks. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. The question was about using a camera with a light table or a light. And yes, these are scanning masks. What it does is hold your size, either 120, in this case, 120, 110, and 35 into an area that you can control it, lays down, and it can be scanned effectively. Now, some more inexpensive ways, and again, inexpensive is relative. This, I forget the name of this particular one, but this is designed to go on the end of a macro lens and you shoot it. And what does that give you? It gives you a digital, real good copy. Not to say that the other scanners won't, but if you talk to the scanning nerds, they will tell you that a flatbed scanner doesn't work, which is a debatable point. This is the expensive one. This can be $2,400 for the setup you see right there but it includes all kinds of extra masks and you can shoot different size film and it's got a stand. The stand alone is $200 without the camera. I have to say that because the picture I took was from one of the stores anyway. These are dedicated scanners for very specific size films. They're a little more affordable. The, um, let me get to it. The one on the left is only a 35 millimeter scanner. Slides, I think, can be scanned with it as well. That one is 300 and not that it really matters that much. I'm sorry. The uh, previous one, you can buy similar ones between 100 and 150 dollars that just basically attach. The this one will run over a hundred twenty one hundred dollars, the one originally that I showed, and sometimes even higher. The blue plus tech is three hundred and thirty to five hundred dollars, depending on what version you get. And the Pacific on the right scans one twenty and thirty five, which is why it's more expensive, and that's about six hundred dollars for that particular version. They also, I'm sorry, 2000, I'm sorry, $2,000 for that version. They also have other scanners, flatbed scanners that are about the same price as some of the other flatbed. Now we get the printing, which is real quick. And we talked about that or somewhat already. You can do it yourself. Print your negatives after you've scanned them using printers. And the printers themselves can run anywhere from, um, hundred dollars to about 10,000, depending on what you want. 10,000 for one of the ones, if any of those people are here, went to our 
conferences years ago and we had the Canon printer sitting there. That one I think was what, 5,000 they said, and we could get it on sale for 4,500 or something like that. But there's two main, I mean, HP, and I'm going I'm sorry I have to say this, but HP makes a printer, it's crap from my personal experiences. <laughs> yeah, it's, like if you want to do four by six snapshots, HP is fine. It's, you can't control much. You may get some color variations on it. They have a limited number of color inks. The one on the left, eight inks. Photo cayenne, photo magenta, magenta, cayenne, black, light gray, yellow, red. I mean, there's there's enough there that you can get a really nice print without paying the money to Dan Berg to print it, which is going to be more expensive. But that printer only goes 13 by 19. The Epson has a continuous roll that you could put in the back so you could do it as long as you want. But again, the software for the printers control what you can do. If you put a 22 inch piece of photo paper or not photo paper, but printer paper into that Canon, you're gonna get an eight and a half by 22 inch picture because it can't do and doesn't recognize border to border. The Epson might be able to do that. Epson has a better quality DPI and that's a debatable term, quality DPI, because they have 8 million or whatever DPI. The Canon has like 3,200 or 2,400. But it, to a point, to a point, it doesn't really matter because you can only see so much on a, on a paper. Yes, Marshall. Yes, Ken, I think you better explain this maybe for some of the people in Zoom what the DPI is. That's dots per inch. DPI, dots per inch, I'm sorry. That's the same thing you consider when you're printing digital photos too. Okay. Photo papers, another consideration. There are papers that you can buy anywhere. There are cheap ones. You wanna go to Walmart, get the Walmart brand paper. That's great for four by six pictures. Staples the same way. You can find good quality, basic, glossy, or matte papers. There's also better papers, more artistic, so that if you want to take your picture and hang it on the wall outside, you don't want to use a Walmart 8x10 glossy. It's just not going to look good. You're going to look for papers from other manufacturers, and these are a group that will give you good paper. Canon and Epson have excellent papers, which are reasonably priced. Red River, Moab, Canson, Ink Press, and there's a bunch of others that get up there in price. You could be paying, normally you pay a dollar, two dollars for print if you buy their papers, that's what it costs. If you use the cheaper papers, then you're really down to a very affordable price. Printing services, what we talked about, and again, for people who only just want to do a little film shooting and then have somebody else do it, Dan Berg, if you really want something nice and printed on canvas or something, he's excellent. He does our printing, if you don't already know that, for us. Dan's camera in Allentown, very affordable. The darkroom, retro here, and I guess it's retro is what they're called, right? Yes. I'm sorry? Retro. Oh, they're not. No. Oh, that's news to me. No. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'm going to wrap it up. Yeah. All right. And can we go out the one at the bottom of these steps? One at the bottom of the steps should be uh, right now, but I'll make sure it's Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Here's your cost. Mail in anywhere from $12 or more. You can see it on the screen for 24 exposure. When you go up to 36, it may go up 
black and white, local, $8 for color, 12 for black and white. They don't do black and white. If you go to Dan's, for example, he sends it out. Now, I don't know, I'm assuming that Moto Photo still does developing and will do black and white because she did do it when I was having it done. But higher quality scans, that's another thing. If you order scans, they give you a very basic scan. If you want a better quality because you want to blow it up beyond eight and a half by 10 or something or 11, you're going to pay more for it. Some of them won't ever send your negatives back. What they'll do instead is give you a DVD. That's their scan. But a lot of places you have to look, and I'm not saying you can't do this anywhere, but basically you need to look at their website, talk to them, find out what they charge. Dan's Cardinal, any of the more reputable ones, you go on their website, you'll see exactly what they charge. There's no question of what they'll do. But if you want extras for most of them, extras beyond what they consider to be their basic, you're gonna pay. So you could be up into $20 or more a roll of developing. So if you develop it at home, not considering all the other upfront costs, six to $7 a roll. Because you scan it yourself, you print it yourself, you develop it yourself, it saves a lot of money. And I didn't even get it, we gotta stop. Otherwise it's gonna be forever. Thank you, thank you. It's saying on Zoom that they told us we need to get out. Yes, yeah. Zoom, they told us to get out. Okay. No, I took too long. <laughs>